Yeah, and thanks. And okay. here's some ways. Okay. Well, thanks, Bill, for uh, inviting me to this interesting meeting to share my data and some uh, some ideas. Um, whoops. So, um, as, as John Cleese used to say, is now for something completely different. What I, what I want to talk about now is not vast amounts of bacteria or, or, or a vast taxonomic diversity or a whole lot of different cell types. I want to make a very focused talk on a one cell type, the epithelia, and this intimate interaction here between the microbiota. So I'm talking about a very reductionistic, very simplistic uh, intera dyad between one cell type and, and, uh, and bacteria. And it, as it turns out, it's, it's essentially one class of bacteria, which is completely different from what we've been talking about. But nonetheless, I think some aspects of reductionistic science does retain a, a lot of value in the analysis of the microbiota. Anyhow, here's the obligatory slide, effects of the microbiota on the gut. And we've been through this ad nauseum today. C competitive exclusion of pathogens, we'll hear more about that with the microbiota. Uh, uh, metabolic nutritional energy utilization, vitamin synthesis, short-chain fatty acids, uh, all very well understood. Uh, lots of great interest in adaptive immune regulation, induction of T cells by various subsets of uh, 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 the adaptive immune system. Innate immune regulation, dampening of immune responses, all classical uh, uh, responses that workers in microbiota and probiotics have been evaluating. And the area I want to just touch, a bit, touch base today is epithelial development and survival. As well known, there's cytoprotective effects of, of signaling. Uh, uh, Gene Chang talked about the heat shock proteins. But what I want to talk about is stimulation of barrier function and uh, IEC, epithelial, uh, intestinal epithelial cell restitution and proliferation. So some basic background, I'm sure this is common to most people here, or commonly known to most people here, is the epithelia in mammals is three-dimensional. There's crypts uh, with the um, stem cells proliferating uh, up through a transient amplifying compartment where they undergo differentiation and ultimately are shed through an apoptotic process. Uh, the differentiation can go into various cell types, absorptive, goblet cells that secrete mucins, uh, uh, endocrine, endocrine, and uh, panna cells. Anyhow, so that's the normal process of the gut epithelia. However, germ-free studies uh, over the years, even decades, have shown that the small intestinal crypts show slower turnover of the epithelial cells with the crypt of transit time doubling, indicating at least some uh, enhancing role of the microbiota collectively in, the, in these processes. It's also been shown uh, as markedly attenuated regenerative responses to, to colonic injury, uh, uh, implying there's roles in restitution. So it brings up the question, so it's well known, and no, one's, no one here is going to argue, that the microbiota can influence normal homeostasis in the gut, aside from tra uh, the tra traditional innate immune responses. I'm not going to touch base at all today on the classic TLR or uh, NOD protein. And everyone knows it's a, it's a very critical aspect, both uh, of innate immune and adaptive immune regulation, as well as underlying homeostasis. I'm trying to uh, talk about a, a novel, extremely highly conserved pathway, which may work in parallel to those systems. But they all go back to the question of how the normal microbiota mechanistically interacts with the epithelia is not well understood. It's kind of an obvious statement. And a sort of a sub-statement in parallel, uh, more specifically, is how the microbiota can influence epithelial growth and proliferation is also not well understood. So what I want to broach today is this concept about reactive oxygen species, ROS, uh, and their influence on cell proliferation and, and differentiation, and build the case that this is a very ancient, highly conserved mechanism by which numerous, path, numerous cell systems uh, can, can, work, uh, can stimulate growth and differentiation as well as other signaling functions. But to go over uh, some, some literature in the past, ROS, which are incompletely reduced oxygen molecules, have potent signaling functions that are outside their, their, their more commonly uh, uh, conceptualized role as, as antimicrobial. Uh, and they've been involved in, in differentiation and proliferation processes in organisms as simple as social amoeba in the dictostelium, where uh, superoxide signaling is necessary for its formation of the fruiting bodies once its, its contact with bacteria, its food source runs out. There's numerous papers showing plant, in plant biology uh, of transcriptional regulation of ROS by upregulation of various peroxidases controls d d uh, proliferation and differentiation as the root as it migrates to the, the, uh, the microbial soil. Uh, Drosophila has a number of papers out uh, showing uh, differentiation and proliferation, particularly in the hematopoietic uh, um, uh, lymph gland of the fly. Two very, very recent papers in, in, in uh, vertebrate systems in, the, uh, in Xenopus showing uh, ROS signaling uh, is involved in um, to have uh, a tail regeneration and also uh, cell differentiation in mouse uh, uh, spermatogenesis. So just a little bit of background on, on the biochemistry. Uh, reactive oxygen species traditionally been conceptualized as highly reactive uh, deleterious molecules from the incomplete reduction of molecular oxygen. 
uh, hydroxy radical hyp hypochlorous acid and peroxy nitrate indeed are highly damaging to macromolecules. Uh, they can cause a lot of damage or associated with the aging response, um, except when they're harnessed as an antimicrobial uh, action, which occurs in the uh, phagocytic vacuoles of uh, phagocytes. But this is the traditional role. However, it's been uh, it, it, uh, it's recently been appreciated um, that there's a lot of signaling roles for the non-radical ROS, such as uh, hydrogen peroxide and nitric oxide, which have potent roles in, in transiently and non-permanently uh, uh, modifying enzymes. And this brings up this concept of redox regulation of enzymes. It's a subclass of enzymes that are defined by a uh, cysteine residue in the active site that it's act it exists as a phthalate anion at low pKa. And in the presence of, of H2O2, uh, can undergo rapid and transient uh, modification of sulfenic acid and disulfide. Uh, this, this, is, this, is, this is a form of oxidant stress, and it's very rapid and very reversible, uh, and can be highly localized. Uh, known target enzymes include numerous enzymes involved in the um, ubiquitin-like uh, ubiquitin -like protein pr processing, including SUMO and NET8. Uh, dual, specific, dual specificity kinases involved in MAP kinase signaling, um, low molecular weight PTPases and cell motility, and some pathways that are actually involved in redox uh, sensing itself. So the, uh, the ROS generated uh, is not exogenous. It's deliberately generated by a class of enzymes called the NOx enzymes. This just brings up is why the hell would all these cells and organisms have, have enzymes that, that del deliberately produce ROS? It's generally uh, been found to be for these signaling functions. The original member is the um, uh, is NOx, what's now called NOx2, originally called GP91-FOX, which is the classic uh, respiratory burst enzyme in mammalian phagocytes. And the old timers here will, will, will recognize the uh, formal peptide receptor stimulated ROS oxygen burst is one of the, the, the canonical uh, reactions of experimental pathology described back in the uh, 50s or 60s. But anyhow, uh, uh, subsequent work has shown these NOxes are, are expressed in, there's uh, 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 five, um, Forms pre uh, expressed in the human in many, many cells, including neurons, epithelia, and endothelia, that are non-phagocytic, and they're expressed all through the, uh, uh, the uh, all through metazoans, including plants uh, and, and and other animals. In each in each case, uh, plants and animals. In each case, it's been implicated in response to microbes, indicating it's a very highly conserved fundamental pathway. Uh, but what we're in multi uh, um, multicellular organisms respond to, to bacteria including plants, which have numerous defensive responses when they're invaded. In C. elegans, there's defensive responses to a, a, a duox-like uh, molecule in C. elegans. For Drosophila, there's both a duox and a nox. Uh, we'll spend some time on this uh, with the Drosophila system. We mentioned mammalian professional phagocytes. And the nox-1, which is present in mammalian barrier epithelia, which is obviously relevant to our discussion today. The other aspect and background I want to bring up is this concept of the formal peptide receptor pathway, which again was characterized in phagocytes as a response to uh, virtually all bacteria. It's what causes neutrophils to, to uh, migrate towards uh, the formal peptide. It's essentially a PAMP. It's a modified a translation project um, product from all bacteria. Um, and what brought this to the forefront is when we and our uh, collaborators discovered these uh, formal peptide receptors were expressed actually on the epithelia uh, of, of, of the gut and other epithelial tissues. In a series of papers over the years, we characterized this pathway, whereas the FPRs can monitor, detect formal peptides, activate NOx family members, produce ROS, cause inactivation of various target enzymes, and subsequent uh, downstream effects, including effects on motility, proliferation, and immune suppression. And I'd like to discuss uh, uh, aspects on uh, epithelial pr uh, movement and proliferation further. So this starts with our earlier observations showing that, the that in, in vitro and in vivo, the commensal bacteria can stimulate ROS generation. And these experiments were facilitated by the, by the uh, development of these uh, uh, specific uh, dyes that can be put in the cells or non-toxically injected into mice so that we can look at the, uh, the, the tissues. But he takes cells, you can add, uh, here, here we're using lactobacilli. Now lactobacilli will be a theme of this talk, which I, I, I'll, I'll come back and, and circle around and discuss. But lactobacilli causes a rapid and transient induction of ROS in vitro, and they also in vivo when we gavage mice, e either uh, by gavage or, or transrectal installation. This is actually a, sm a small, small, vi small bowel villi, a, 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 a confocal within 30, 60 minutes of, of, of gavage with lactobacilli, you can see the activation of the ROS. Um, one of the most interesting aspects of this work was found is, is this, this phenomenon is restricted to a subset of bacteria, predominantly the lactobacilli and also um, uh, bifidobacterium. Uh, 
Uh, numerous other bacteria, the B, theta, E. coli, and numerous others fail to show this response, showing it's a, a, a true biologic response that's limited to members of uh, aspects of the specific members of the microbiota. We were able to take, um, uh, isolate a germ uh, um, uh, sequel contents from mice, use this in vitro assay and show a similar effect, whereas uh, from germ-free animals, the uh, sequel contents at a similar density or tur turbidity did not have the ability to stimulate ROS. And in vivo, similarly, by, by gavaging these various strains, you could see that the lactobacilli is by far the most potent inducer of, of this response. This response is dependent on NOx1. This is very recent unpublished data uh, by Renault Jones, who's in the, in, in the audience here. Uh, this is, uh, these are just the different areas of tissues, the colon and the small bowel, showing the, ap uh, the activation of, um, of ROS by uh, uh, lactobacillus rhamnosus, and it's abolished in both cases in, in animals that have a uh, epithelial-specific knockout of the NOx1 uh, uh, ROS-producing enzyme. The other thing we're able to do, this is a work up by uh, um, Ashfaq Alam, also in my lab, is that this, these effects are enhanced around the wound edge, which is a, a common enough phenomenon. This is an in vitro assay. We essentially a scratch wound where you can take a cultured monolayer, scrape them, use the dye, and stimulate them either with bacteria or pure form of peptide and show you the activation of ROS, especially on the edge. And here's a novel system utilizing a, a, um, a veterinary endoscope where we can insert it into the, the distal colon and do, use a biopsy to inflict wounds so we can come back and evaluate. This is a, a method pioneered by Thad Stappenbeck. With our ROS dyes, we're able to show strong upregulation of ROS. It's, it's even more enhanced along the wound edge, which will be relevant in a moment. Um, uh, Non-ROS producing or stimulating bacteria such as E. coli will not do this. And very importantly, uh, the ROS response is lost both in the NOx1 null, uh, null animals uh, and the FPR null animals. And also importantly, the response is preserved in NOx2 null animals, indicating this is not coming from phagocytes, nor in uh, mid-88 null animals. You get a perfectly good response indicating this is not going through the, uh, at least the, the, uh, most of the TLR pathway. Now here's another uh, um, body of work that, that's very similar. This is Drosophila. So I mentioned Drosophila is, is a great system to work for, work for for several reasons. One is it has a reduced genome, so there's only two, two NOx producing it, and two NOxes, a, a D NOx and a D duox. So it's reduced on the, on, the, uh, on the host side. And also they have a wonderfully simple microbiota that may, it's uh, 10 to 20 organisms, depending on how you culture them. And given their size, all these, all these organisms are aerobic uh, and they can generally be cultured. Um, so this is a data, again, by Renault Jones. He was able to generate azenic flies, again, a simple procedure by taking eggs, uh, decorinating them in, in Clorox, essentially, and putting them in autoclave media, and monocolonizing them with various bacteria. And you can show that within minutes of, of certain bacteria, lactobacillus, you see the gut lighting up, and here at higher power individually on the epithelial cells of the fly. Even more remarkably, this is a, um, in first instar larvae, these are much smaller ones as they hatch. Uh, so here you can take the larva, uh, have them hatch into media that is monocolonized with specific bacteria, and you can see the, the lactobacillus, again, uh, stimulates the epithelial cells using the dye in an alternate technique with a transgenic fly line with a redox uh, responsive reporter gene. Uh, what's, uh, what's remarkable about this system, it's a great system for looking at, it, it's, a, it's a multicellular organism that you can look at its, its initial colonization with its microbiota essentially in real time instantly as, as, as they hatch. But what's remarkable here is of the, of the dozens of bacteria we tested, only the fly-specific lactobacillum, the, the, the lactobacillus plantarum, was able to induce ROS. And that's, um, it, we've had previous talks talking about some specific properties about the lactobacilli. And I think it's a very fascinating area of what's specific about the, this taxa that mediates these effects across m many, many different assays. Uh, so similarly, just a, 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 a similar type data, this is, this is fly gut showing the ROS induction. We're able to utilize fly genetics to knock down the two ROS producing enzymes, d -nox, showing it's lost, d duox which is said or generally thought to have more of a defensive function. You, you do not see the loss. This is highly consistent, uh, perfectly consistent with what's seen in the uh, fly, in, in the mice. Uh, and now to change the subject, going from the ROS production to some of the consequences of ROS production, I'm going to talk a little bit about cellular motility. As I, as I mentioned, ROS production and formal peptide receptors are involved in the motility of, of um, phagocytes. And this property seems to extend also to epithelial cells. It's well known that epithelial cells in a wound, they de-differentiate and move along uh, uh, focal adhesions uh, by the action of focal adhesion kinase, which is held in its inactive state by a phosphotyrosine phosphatases. 
uh, physiologically, ROS is produced by NOx, which is in phys physical proximity uh, uh, to these PTPases, causes inactivation, activation of FAC, phosphorylation, formation of actin bundles, and the initiation of, of motility. It's a classic cell biologic phenomenon. What we were able to show, uh, uh, we, we sought to see whether this phenomenon was applied to, to bacterial-induced ROS. Uh, not to get into the details of the biochemistry, but we can use a, a N-ethylmalumide, a probe that, that that will bind to the thiol, anal uh, thiol anionic forms, enables a nice pull-down assay. When it's oxidized by bacteria, that's lost, as well as enzymatic activity. When the, when the enzymatic activity of um, PTPs is gone, FAC is activated. This is the two in vitro and in vivo uh, data showing a, on a wound, uh, 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 on a monolayer, when they're treated with lactobacillus, you see increase of, uh, of the uh, phospho FAC, both uh, overall and specifically all along the wound edge, when you co-localize with a, uh, a phylloidin stain, that's actin bundles, you can see how they co-localize and actually see the, nid the, the nidus formation, the yellow, where the actin bundles are actually sticking and emanating out of the uh, areas of the focal adhesion kinase. So that, that's, those are, uh, so the lactobacillus actually stimulates focal, he focal adhesion formation. In vivo on a wound bed, the colors are reversed, but the phenomenon is the same. Uh, uh, FAC act is, is activated at, at the basolateral aspect of the wound bed by rhamnosis. Functionally, uh, we're able to show on a wound bed assay, these are cells uh, by photo, photo video microscopy, uh, that lactobacillus actually accelerates the pseudopodia extension and, and the, the healing of the wound. That can be quantified and, and a velocity calculated uh, in vitro. And in vivo, utilizing the um, the method of, of Stappenbeck by uh, inflicting wounds with the endoscope uh, and then uh, measuring a, a day, uh, over a daily basis and then utilizing a um, uh, image analysis software, one can calculate wound rates, show that lactobacillus and does, it does indeed uh, uh, induce uh, wound healing. This is similar to what we saw earlier with the skin, although I must admit this is in contact with, with lactobacilli th through, uh, through gavage. Uh, it's not a systemic effect. Uh, and importantly, the, 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 these or this uh, wound healing effect is lost in the FPR null animals and the NOx1 null animals. We can also show in intact uh, epithelia, the uh, uh, barrier function as measured by uh, uh, fluorescinated dextrans is, is increased by lactobacilli uh, of, of this type, as other workers have shown. More in the proliferative aspects, uh, 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 MAP kinase ERK is stimulated by lactobacillus and formulated peptide, as shown on these uh, in vitro. Uh, and again, the effect is lost in FPR and NOx1, the, the signaling components for the bacteria, uh, but not in mid-88. And then, then also the pure proliferation is induced by lactobacilli. This is a, 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 a two different uh, uh, experiments or assays for proliferation in the small bowel of, of the mouse, uh, looking at phospho-H histone-3 or, or EDU incorporation. This is data similar to what the Versalovic lab uh, described a year or so ago, uh, that, that, that lactobacillus causes a, a marked stimulation of growth uh, within the transient amplifying compartment of the small bowel. But well, in this case, what we're able to show is this effect is lost, uh, pretty much abolished or absolutely abolished in the NOx1 null animals and also in other data in the FPR null ones, indicating that they're involved in this, this pro-proliferative response. And then to bring the whole thing uh, uh, full and around, uh, in, in the fly system, it's a two-dimensional sheet, not three dimensions. You have the, the enterocytes, uh, stem cells, and the equivalent of the transit amplifying compartment. Under normal conditions, you can use EDU to label them. Under germ-free conditions, it's, it's greatly suppressed, but the, but the, uh, the growth uh, EDU incorporation can be brought to super normal levels by the addition of lactobacillus within four hours, and that's embolished by the addition of a um, uh, redox sink. And then finally, the genetic experiments, uh, the NOx knockdown abolishes the proliferative effect in, in the flies, whereas the, the duox knockdown has no effect. So the conclusion, and this is, uh, this is from the poster of, of Renault Jones, it's number 20, it's still out there, is NOx-dependent generation of physiologic levels of ROS by lactobacilli and likely other bacteria, that's an in interesting point there, is a novel signaling mechanism for transducing bacterial signals into host regulatory events that mediate intestinal homeostasis, proliferation, and restitution. So the future challenges, what are some novel uh, raw sensitive proteins and pathways? We've happened to come across three or four of them that had been described in, in the, in the non-microbial physiology in the past, including a, a FAC activation and, and the uh, uh, MAP kinase signaling. Um, but there are proteomic approaches of, available utilizing these redox sensitive uh, uh, probes that can enable us to, to, to evaluate the, the whole proteome that's stimulated by uh, uh, ROS produced by, by, 
by uh, bacteria. So that's an area of future development is what's the, what is the entire uh, um, uh, pattern of, of our collection of proteins that could be stimulated in this sense. So correlation with innate immunity and PRR signaling. Uh, there, there's a lot of crosstalk here. FPRs do, are considered an immune receptor. Certain FPRs have been, uh, certain TLRs have been described to induce um, uh, ROS under certain circumstances. And ROS production is a known inducer for some of the inflammasome processes. So there's some, some crosstalk here getting into inflammatory uh, and disease related biology. Another fascinating question is, is correlation with microbial determinants and ba bacterial taxonomy. What is it about these specific bacteria? If it's lactobacilli, is it an adhesive property? Is it a, is, is a single component, uh, com uh, individual components? Uh, up red Polk has shown the, uh, the P40 and P60, I believe, uh, components of lactobacilli that seem to mediate uh, uh, beneficial effects, and uh, we'd like to look at that for, these, for stimulating ROS properties. Um, and the, uh, further bacterial taxonomies, what other bacteria are able to mediate these effects? Lactobacilli are, are very interesting because the, the, they, they colonize, as, as, as we heard today, the, uh, the mammalian gut very rapidly. They, they break down uh, milk oligosaccharides, and, and, are, and in, in, at least in the, in the mouse, they form a very rapid biofilm. So they, they've obviously co-evolved with mammals over millennia. And likewise, in flies, they break down some of the oligosaccharides in the fruit that the fruit fly uh, 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 lives in. So it, it, there's a, a, an evolutionary sense to the, the idea that certain bacteria have co-evolved uh, by virtue of uh, uh, utilizing the energy source that the, uh, that the young animal, whether it's invertebrate or vertebrate, utilizes. And finally, uh, just the idea here that we're showing that the bacteria can control mo epithelial movements and proliferation. What is its role in normal gut development over time in, in, the, in, the, in, in say, neonates uh, or very, very young animals? In wound healing, or the roles in pro, uh, probiotics that, uh, that can, uh, as, we've, as we, we've, we and others have shown, can uh, um, in decrease intestinal permeability and affect a lot of systemic biology and potentially a role in oncogenesis. So I'll basically stop there. One last comment is in some gaps. This is a, a more of a technical talk, so I don't really want to get into technical issues. But the one concept I want to bring up is epithelial cell biology is a host microbial system. We, we heard yesterday the, the appropriate uh, alarm that a lot of our immune systems in these mouse models uh, uh, have to be taken with a grain of salt, realizing the alterations in the microbiota uh, can affect the uh, uh, adaptive immunity in the whole organism. And from the, from the perspective of an epithelial cell biologist, one has to accept that epithelials don't exist in a dish by themselves. They, they are chronically, tonically in contact with bacteria of different uh, densities, uh, uh, different taxonomic compositions. So future experiments looking at epithelial cell biology really have to uh, keep in mind the, the fact that they are normal, they evolved and are designed to be exposed to the microbiota. Uh, so I think that's an important uh, gap that needs to be perceived on. Uh, the other thing, just more technically, um, I think some of this work does show some of the advantages of model system work in flies. I know there's other workers who utilize zebrafish. It is a nice um, vertebrate model. Uh, C. elegans can be used for some of these simple systems and others. And I think it'd be an interesting area to develop uh, uh, or future meetings or, or, or future symposia for people utilizing some of these experimental systems, which can be usefully reductionistic for looking at aspects of host mi microbiota interactions. And that sort of brings me to the final comment about comparative metagenomics. Uh, obviously, a fly only has a couple dozen uh, 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 organisms in its microbiota, but they obviously have so, some uh, critical um, uh, roles in controlling proliferation and nutrition, as, as, as we've heard. Uh, so some of the comparisons uh, of these, these much more simple microbiota uh, might be uh, informative in bringing sense to these very large data sets we have with uh, the mammalian systems. So I think I'll stop there. Uh, acknowledge uh, workers in my lab, Ashfaq Alam, Hui Sha Wu, Trio Desai, uh, Jeff McKinty, Phil Swanson, my collaborator, Renault Jones, who did, a lot, did all the fly work, uh, and Osman Misrat, who helped us out with the cell biology, and of course, for uh, support from the NIH. So thank you very much. Thank you, Andy, and, and thank you for uh, minding the time so well. Um, that does leave us time for a, a couple of questions. Um, and while people are making their way to the microphone, I'll start off, I think. Um, have you had a chance to uh, do any kind of uh, characterization studies of the uh, commensal factors that are activating NOx1? Uh, 
Yeah, the, 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 the little smidgen of data we have is we have some mutants in, in, in the lactobacilli that, that affect some of the S, the, the, uh, the S proteins in, in, the, uh, in the cell wall, which are said to affect um, uh, adhesion, and we're in the process of, of, of looking at that now. But preliminarily, it does look that, that, that defective adhesion by the lactobacilli uh, reduces a lot of these responses. But uh, that's, that, that, that's a whole microbiologic frontier right there in and of itself. Do you know if the lactobacilli are activating any specific toll receptors? Um, well, they're not activating any of the, uh, the, the mid-88 one, uh, the responses aren't going through mid-88. Um, and so, and that's a hard question to ask because if we're using, e e over the years, e you can get conditions where, where, where lactobacilli will activate uh, uh, traditional pro-inflammatory signaling in epithelial cells cultured. But, what, but if you have a fully polarized, uh, uh, true gut epithelial model, uh, they do not respond to lactobacilli at all. Uh, you can get ERK activation, which is some of what prompted this whole business looking at ROS, but you don't see junk, you don't see NF-kappa B, you don't see P38 or, or, or others. But something, or ACT will come up and, and some others, but the, the, and that sort of steers us into this proliferation away from the traditional inflammatory models. Uh, Senators? Do these various pathways operate under physiological hypoxia? Physi uh, can you elaborate on that a bit? I mean, uh, especially in IBD, there's a state of hypoxia in the in the gut epithelial layer. And I'm just wondering if these pathways will operate. Well, they certainly will operate, you know, during oral gavage in a mouse when, when we you know, dissect later. So that's that, that's as physiological we can get. In in the flies, I mentioned there is no physiologic hypoxia okay. because they're they're small enough. You get diffusion. It's everything's aerobic, uh, and that's a very valid uh, concern with the in vitro studies because none of those are going to be truly or, well, for various reasons. They're just not going to model exactly what, a, aspects of cell biology or host biology like what you're saying there. Thanks. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next speaker is Peter Tonbach from Harvard University, and the title of his talk is Moving Towards a Metagenomic Basis of Therapeutics.